Nietzsche once wrote in his unpublished notes, I could become the Buddha of Europe, though admittedly an antipode to the Indian Buddha. Today I'd like to explore what Nietzsche meant by this, and why these two philosophies may be closer than previously thought. Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher of the late 19th century, was a prolific author and academic outsider. Nietzsche is well known for his critique of religion and morality. Examining the cultural developments of his time, Nietzsche found that Christianity could no longer command society's ethical framework, as the belief in the Christian God has become unbelievable, and that everything that was built upon this faith, propped up by it, grown into it, including the whole of our European morality, is destined for collapse. From this collapse rose the threat of nihilism, an ultimate negation of life. But it was not only that nihilism rose from where religion was not, but that religion itself gave rise to this nihilism, such as within Christianity's condemnation of earthly existence and desire for an alternate true world. Nietzsche's critique of Christianity is well known, but let's know that Nietzsche placed Buddhism next to Christianity. Throughout his works, Nietzsche makes it clear that, in his eyes, Buddhism is a nihilism. In The Will to Power, he writes, The two great nihilistic movements are Buddhism and Christianity, and in the genealogy of morals, the great Indian religion and philosophy was judged by Nietzsche to be a nihilistic turning away from life, a longing for nothingness. And in Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche writes that Gautama Buddha was under the dominion and delusion of morality. Nietzsche determines that Buddhism is not an act of nihilism, wherein man's spiritual vigor has surpassed the goals he had set for himself, but a passive nihilism, a sign of weakness, wherein spiritual strength may be fatigued, exhausted, so that the goals and values which have prevailed hitherto are no longer suited to it and are no longer believed in. And it is this passive nihilism that Nietzsche found to be ultimately threatening, so much so that he feared its growth across Europe as a triumph of pessimism for the West is, at one in their involuntary beglooming and heart softening, under the spell of which Europe seems to be threatened with a new Buddhism. From his common categorization of Buddhism as a nihilism throughout his writing, Nietzsche seldom provides an adequate analysis of specific Buddhist ideas and his reasoning for taking Buddhism to be nihilistic. When examined, the reason for this becomes clear. The pessimistic judgment of Buddhism that Nietzsche articulates was not his original understanding. Instead, it came from the philosophy of another. Nietzsche's conception of Buddhism as a nihilism has been attributed to two common causes. The first, held by Morrison, simply attributes Nietzsche's characterization of Buddhism to Nietzschean anthropology and study of religion. This would mean that Nietzsche took Buddhism to be little different from other religions. Such an explanation seems unsteady since it is clear that Nietzsche chose Buddhism to write about along with Christianity, as opposed to, say, Hinduism or Taoism, for example. The second reason, held by most scholars on the topic, attributes Nietzsche's characterization of Buddhism to the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer, German philosopher of the 19th century, was one of the few philosophers that the young Nietzsche respected. Nietzsche, who was then a student of philology at the University of Leipzig, found in an antiquarian shop a copy of The World as Will and Representation. Nietzsche immediately became a disciple. I belong to the readers of Schopenhauer, Nietzsche said, who after they have read the first page of him know, with certainty, that they will read all his pages, and that they will listen to every word that he has said. It would be under the spell of Schopenhauer that Nietzsche's study of Eastern philosophies began, and thus Schopenhauer's conception of Buddhism would become Nietzsche's. Schopenhauer's philosophy was one of pessimism, the motto being that suffering is essential to all life. Expanded upon, this is the view that the world of daily life is essentially violent and frustrating. It is a world that, as long as our consciousness remains at that level where the principle of sufficient reason applies in its fourfold root, will never resolve itself into a condition of greater tranquility. Only in the complete denial of life, of the will, in asceticism, can one hope to find some relief from the endless suffering that is existence. Schopenhauer, living during a time when the Western study of Eastern philosophy was still new, 
found the ideas of the Buddhist and Vedantic traditions fascinating, reading the Upanishads before bed many nights. In appreciating both of these philosophies, Schopenhauer failed to separate Brahmanism and Buddhism, conflating the two as though they shared a philosophy. While the two traditions share some concepts, as they are both Indian religions, to conflate them is entirely inaccurate. Buddhism began in opposition to Brahmanism, when the Buddha had failed to find what he was looking for throughout the Vedic tradition. On top of this, he believed that he saw, within the thought of South Asia, his own pessimistic philosophy. From the Upanishads, Schopenhauer saw the relative existence of ideas as part of the eternal flux of things, empty as a dream, whose reality was hidden from mortals by Maya, the veil of deception. And in terms of Buddhism, Schopenhauer took the concepts of Nirvana, Dukkha, and on Atman to be confirmations of his own pessimistic philosophy, saying that, to those in whom the will has turned and has denied itself, this our world, which is so real, with all its suns and milky ways, is nothing. This is also just the prana paramita of the Buddhists, the beyond all knowledge. Nietzsche went on to reject Schopenhauer's pessimism, but still hold on to Schopenhauer's pessimistic depiction of Buddhism. Hence why the mention of Schopenhauer accompanies many of Nietzsche's mentions of Buddhism. As when Nietzsche writes, the will to non-entity prevails over the will to life. And the general aim now is, in Christian Buddhistic Schopenhauerian phraseology, it is better not to be than to be. And why Panayoti states that Nietzsche feared Buddhism's second incarnation as Schopenhauerian pessimism. Schopenhauer's, and therefore Nietzsche's, view on Buddhism as a nihilism was misguided. Interestingly enough, there existed the information that would have fixed the Schopenhauerian conception of Buddhism in the works of Oldenburg and Muller, both of which were texts in Nietzsche's library, but Nietzsche did not adopt them. At the foundation of Schopenhauer's misunderstanding stands the concept of suffering. As I've already said, Schopenhauer's pessimistic outlook saw all life to be suffering, with the only out in the ascetic denial of the will. At first, those familiar with Buddhism will recognize the word suffering and its affiliation with one of the Buddhist three marks of existence, or three central concepts. Dukkha is often translated as suffering, and no doubt plays a large role in Buddhism. Dukkha, as understood by Schopenhauer, suggests that life is nothing other than pain and struggle. And Schopenhauer takes the accompanying Buddhist concept of nirvana to be the denial of the will, best translated as annihilation, and the path towards it to be a nihilistic yearning for nothingness. However, this does not best describe the Buddhist path. It is true that Buddhism begins with the acknowledgement of dukkha. Dukkha may be better translated as dissatisfaction, as it does not always come in the intensity associated with suffering. It is the understanding that dissatisfaction is an innate, inseparable characteristic of life in the realm of samsara, as opposed to nirvana. For all happiness is fleeting, and the return of dissatisfaction is destined in our lives of ups and downs. Not even in death is one free from dukkha, since they are bound to be reborn and face dissatisfaction once again. Had this been the full extent of the Buddha's teachings, Buddhism may well accord with Schopenhauer's philosophy. However, dukkha is but only the first of the four noble truths. The second articulates that this dissatisfaction has a root, and that cause is craving or attachment. With the root cause found, there is a possibility to bring an end to dissatisfaction. This comprises the third noble truth, and the final of the four noble truths is the Eightfold Path by which one can attain liberation from the round of rebirth. This liberation is nirvana, the extinguishing of greed, aversion, and delusion. There exist two stages of nirvana, the second stage, at one's death, where their karmic cycle has come to an end. This is what Nietzsche and Schopenhauer have taken to be a longing for nothingness, or for a true world. However, it is not a longing for nothingness, nor a true world, but simply the end of samsara or the karmic cycle. And the first stage is during one's life, when they have been released of all desire and experience tranquility and freedom from negative mental states. As we can see in opposition to Schopenhauerian pessimism, there is for the Buddhist a process that started 
as what seemed to be a negative and pessimistic analysis of life leads one to the awakening necessary for the positive experience of nirvana. The next topic of misunderstanding is the meaning of anatman or anatta, commonly translated as no-self or non-self. Anatman comes across as a negation of the will, and Schopenhauer took it to be an advocacy for an annihilation of the self. However, it is not a destruction of the self, but a rejection of the existence of a self. This distinction may be more apparent in the next topic, but Anatman states that it is not that there is no you, rather that you are just a bundle of various aspects. Ultimately, it is the idea that the substantial enduring self is a fiction. The Mahayana Buddhist concept of Shunyata would have been easily misinterpreted by the likes of Schopenhauer. From early scholarship of the East, Shunyata has been translated as nothingness. In doing so, being a central concept of Mahayana Buddhism, it reflects on all of this tradition as a pessimistic yearning for nothing, as a nihilism. This is not an accurate view. Shunyata was articulated by the Indian philosopher Nagarjuna, and instead refuted nihilism, as well as eternalism and a number of other isms. Shunyata is better understood as emptiness, and it is the idea that all things are empty of inherent existence. Not that all things are non-existent, but that inherent existence is an incoherent notion. For all things arise codependently. Nagarjuna wrote, To say it is, is to grasp for permanence. To say it is not, is to adopt the view of nihilism. Therefore, a wise person does not say exists or does not exist. It existed before, but does not now, entails the error of nihilism. These concepts and their misunderstandings point to an interesting aspect of Buddhism. Negation, in much of the East, does not have the same pessimistic connotation that it does in the West. Hence the early misunderstanding of these concepts as nihilistic. So too for the Taoist concept of Wu Wei. Now, with the understanding that Buddhism is not a nihilism, there is the possibility of compatibility or overlap between the two philosophies. Scholars who have written on Nietzsche and Buddhism all seem to suggest one thing, that Nietzsche's philosophy is more like Buddhism than Nietzsche himself realized. Both are invested in the human condition and are concerned about nihilism. There, they share a fundamental connection. Nietzsche and the Buddha and his disciples through their ideas, ask the question, how is it that one can move beyond the crisis of nihilism, avoid resentment, and salvage a sense of value and worth while still affirming a world that is neither constant nor lasting? With this considered, it should be no surprise that, when we examine some of the answers that Nietzsche formulated in response to the questions he was asking, we find that he was very close to some of the basic doctrines found in Buddhism. To keep this video timely, I'll examine three examples. The first of these overlapping ideas is revenge, and it is the only idea which Nietzsche himself was knowingly in agreement with. In the Pali Canon, the doctrinal foundation of Theravadan Buddhism, the simile of the Sa articulates Buddhist intolerance for revenge. Within it, the Buddha taught this. Monks, even if bandits were to carve you up savagely, limb by limb, with a two-handled saw, he among you, who let his heart get angered, even at that, would not be doing my bidding. Even then you should train yourselves. Our mind will be unaffected, and we will say no evil words. We will remain sympathetic, with a mind of good will, and with no inner hate. We will keep pervading these people, with an awareness imbued with good will. And, beginning with them, we will keep pervading the all-encompassing world, with an awareness imbued with good will. Abundant, expansive, immeasurable, free from hostility, free from ill will. That's how you should train yourselves. In the few pages that Nietzsche comments kindly on Buddhism, he acknowledges his agreement with the Buddha's take on revenge. From his book The Antichrist, he, the Buddha, does not advocate any conflict with unbelievers. His teaching is antagonistic to nothing so much as revenge, aversion, resentment. And in all this he was right, for it is precisely these passions which, in view of his main purpose, are unhelpful. It was vengeance for Nietzsche that led to the establishment of slave morality in their jealousy for the aristocracy, and it is revenge why the greatest haters in history have been priests. 
I've already spoken of on Atman and its misunderstanding, but the concept, somewhat ironically, is one of great overlap. On Atman, or no self, is the understanding that the self is not one concrete enduring substance, but instead constructed of the five skandhas, or aggregates. These five aggregates of clinging, comprised of body, sensations, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness, bring rise to a sense of personality. But no singular part can be pointed to and accurately attributed that this is myself. Nietzsche states the doctrine of Anatman when he writes, the subject is a piece of fiction. The ego of which everyone speaks when he blames egoism does not exist at all. And he articulates the understanding that our attributed self is but an aggregate when he states, our ego, which is not one with a unitary controlling force of our beings, is really only an imagined synthesis. Therefore, there can be no egoistic actions. And again, subject, object, attribute. These distinctions have been made and are now used like schemes to cover all apparent facts. The false fundamental observation is this, that I believe it is I who does something, who suffers something, who has something, who has a quality. But how can Nietzsche have had such a similar concept without addressing it? Nietzsche's on atman like idea was unlikely to have been entirely borrowed from Buddhism, but rather from David Hume, who described the self as nothing more than a bundle or collection of different perceptions. This is Hume's bundle theory, which parallels the Buddhist on atman and skandhas. The specifics of this association would require analysis of Hume and on atman While this is not where this video is going, it is a fruitful idea for another. Samsara, a concept shared by most of Indian philosophy, is the karmic cycle, to be compared with Christianity, where at death, the soul departs from the earthly body, samsara suggests that, at death, one is reborn to a realm determined by their karma. This is continued every death, non-stop, in a cyclical manner, only to be ended, in the case of the Buddhist tradition, by nirvana. Nietzsche's eternal recurrence is often vague and induces varying meanings, but its central idea is familiar to the Buddhist, since Nietzsche's articulations of the doctrine all involve hypothesizing or inducing the reader to imagine or depicting a character considering the idea that all events in the world repeat themselves in the same sequence through an eternal series of cycles. Whether this is a metaphysical statement or simply a thought experiment, it is a simplistic depiction of samsara in the works of Nietzsche. Of course, this is not the full extent of the possible associations. There are bound to be further connections, such as the notion of self-overcoming as a means to spiritual growth, or Nietzsche's practices of meditative solitude and dietetics. And so I pose the question to you, what other connections are there between Nietzsche and Buddhism, or between Nietzsche and other Eastern philosophies? But no matter the specific number of overlapping ideas, it is clear that Nietzsche and Buddhism are indeed closer than previously thought. Nietzsche's understanding of Buddhism as a nihilism will also reflect on Nietzsche's own conception of nihilism. Nietzsche has often been wrongly asserted to be a nihilist. However, as this inspection shows, Nietzsche was not the antipode to the Buddha, but rather the antipode to Schopenhauer and his pessimism. As Elman would say, because he affirmed the world, Nietzsche was not a nihilist, nor is Buddhism a nihilistic religion. On these premises, only Schopenhauer was a thoroughgoing nihilist. Now that's all I've got to talk about today. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed, leave a like and subscribe. As always, let me know your thoughts or anything I got wrong. And until next time.